What's happening, everybody? And thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale. And as always, sitting next to me, es mi amigo, Kylo Mike Filson. How's it going, everybody? Yes, I'm here. Enjoying this. What is this here? Pineapple coconut. It's my favorite body one. Body armor. Yes. You got to, because it was 100. Now, look, everything always <laughs> reads different. So it might be like your rear view mirror freaking thermostat's going to read higher and all that stuff. But I know that I saw in my car, my work car, my personal truck, and uh, on the bank between 102 and 111 around here today. It's hot. That's all I know. That's all I know is I it was, was warm. I was just trying to explain to my sons the other day that long ago, you know, if you didn't have a thermometer, you would actually call the bank and they would have a voicemail thing that would tell you the temperature what the forecast time is going to be for the week. Time and temperature. You could tick, 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 time and temperature and listen to it. And they yeah. were like, that sounds ridiculous. And then I was like, it is. It is ridiculous. <laughs> That's all that we had. It. Yeah. Remember you would call like the movie theater too? Yep. Things just, man, it's everything's so easy now. I don't ever think about it being strange because my kids are older, but when you have to explain it to your kids and then they look at us like, I hate being there when you do it because they lay those eyes on you and you feel like they're judging you. <laughs> like, did you grow up? Did you have to ride a horse to school every day? You know, they look at you like you were living in the time of no electricity when you were like, oh, I just had to call the bank. Well, to find out if it was hot. They'll never know the joys of like riding in a car in the winter with the windows up and both your grandparents smoking and refusing <laughs> to roll the windows down. Like they just, almost spit that drink out. Sorry. I didn't realize you were drinking. <laughs> like they really don't encounter that many people that even smoke. No. Because, I mean, we don't smoke. My wife doesn't smoke. Uh, when they go, every, smoking's banned everywhere. So, like, literally, if I was to ask the twins, name me five brands of cigarettes, I'm not even sure they could do one. They'll also never know the joys of standing up in the back seat of the truck so he, you can reach through the side and glass to get your dad a beer so you can hand him another beer while he's driving. While you're just standing up, leaning over the, the split seats from the little back seat, watching everybody going down the road. Riding in the back of the, the bed of the yep. pickup. Yep. To do that all the time, yeah. No, they'll never, they'll never, they'll never experience that. I wonder why. Which it took, is probably for no, the better. No, it's better. Yes, I'm. I'm wondering why it took the public so long to realize like that's probably not healthy. <laughs> because yet again, like you understand, we understood physics then, right? In inertia, and if your vehicle comes to a quick stop, what happens to everybody in the truck? We were being raised <laughs> by the children of the '60s. What did you expect to happen? <laughs> They were letting us have all the freedoms that they didn't have growing up. <laughs> Man. Yeah. All right. Look, folks, we have got a really, really fun interview for y'all today. We haven't gotten to speak to him in a long time. We had Ryan Sprague hop on, start doing some UFO talk. And uh, yeah, the Ryan Sprague, the fellow from uh, Somewhere in the Skies podcast. He's written a book, Somewhere in the Skies. We got all kinds of good stuff mm -hmm. to talk to him about. But before we jump into that. I have an account from a fella named WB that I need to pass on because I want y'all to hear this. This is how it starts out. I worked at Keystone Resort in Colorado for a few years, and during the summers, we would set up for conferences, weddings, and things of that nature. A number of weddings were performed at one of the mountaintop buildings that would be high-end dining cafeterias in the winter and functions in the summer. Imagine mountaintop beautiful wood buildings with huge stone fireplaces and magnificent vistas off of huge wooden decks. Nice places for your weddings if you can afford it. Anyway, to get these places required driving, or to get up here, along dirt roads that would snake through valleys and then up switchback roads along the mountain until you reach the top and the building in question. It was approximately eight miles of winding mountain roads. And one night we had a quick turnaround from a conference into a wedding the following afternoon. This required moving lots of tables and chairs out and down the mountain and moving up different tables and chairs for the wedding. So we would have a crew breaking down the previous setup and loading a truck, which would then be driven down to a building that had the other equipment and then would be unloaded and reloaded by the crew there and then driven back up the mountain. Well, I was the one driving the truck. So here I am driving the long, twisty, eight-mile drive back up the mountain with my last equipment load. I'm about a mile, a mile and a half from my destination, which means I'm in the middle of the switchbacks that are weaving their way up the mountain. And my truck coughs a few times and then shuts off. Now I try to restart it, but I get nothing. And at this point, I'm pissed. I have no radio, and now I have to hoof it to the mountaintop building to radio down for another truck 
So what do I do? I bail out and start walking. I get about a hundred yards and I hear something off in the woods. A kind of heavy footfall and some brush snapping. Well, I freeze. The darkness is damn near absolute. This road has no lighting at all. Just the little light coming from about a quarter moon. That familiar shiver shoots straight from my lower back right to the top of my head. I'm straining to hear anything at all, but I don't hear anything. I start to walk again, trying to walk very softly, and my head keeps moving back and forth trying to catch any slight sound. I get about another 25 yards and the movement in the wood starts up again. It's sort of shadowing me from uphill and behind. There are tingles all through my body. My eyes feel like dinner plates and my breath is coming in big gasps. I stop and I try and look for any movement at all and the movement in the woods stops again and my brain is telling me, don't worry, it's a deer or elk or it might even be a bear. But my subconscious is screaming Bigfoot. Now I'm trying to maintain my calm, but calm has quickly left the building. I start walking very fast, trying to discern any sounds from behind me. It doesn't take long. The footfalls and the brush begin moving through and it all starts up as I start moving. And that was all she wrote for me. I take off. I'm running hell bent for leather, reaching the building and safety before I am slaughtered by the unknown. And I hear crashing in the underbrush for about another 15 to 20 seconds. And after that, all I can hear is the pounding of my blood in my head and the jolting thuds of my own feet hitting the ground. I have no idea how fast I ran that last mile and a half to that building. I'm sure that at any moment something was going to grab me from out of the darkness. I made it to safety of the building and dashed inside. And everyone there, of course they all turned to look at me, and then they just set me down and gave me a big drink from the bar. I must have been white as a ghost. My buddies gave me plenty of crap for being scared, but none of them set foot outside to check on my story. They just radioed for another truck to come <laughs> and get the stuff and to take out of my broke down vehicle and bring it the rest of the way up. I finished up my shift and then I got cross eyed drunk the next day. <laughs> I've never been so scared in the woods in my life. And in case you couldn't tell, I'm not an outdoorsy type. I don't hunt or camp. I have no idea what it was in the woods that night. My rational size side says it's just a big animal. But my paranoia tells me it was something else. Now, I never saw anything. I just heard noise. And to this day, I still think it was probably just an elk or a bear. But try telling yourself that when you're all alone in the pitch black woods. WB. Wow. Right? What an encounter. Uh, look, I get it. You're not outdoorsy and all that stuff, but look, being outdoorsy or being out or not outdoorsy, you can still get the hell scared out of you. It doesn't matter. You're a human and things eat you. You're made out of stuff bears like to eat. So that's something else that you got to think about too. But I don't, I will tell you what I know of elk and deer, right? They don't follow you folks. All right. There are, they're prey. You're a predator. <laughs> prey doesn't chase predators down. So it more than likely wasn't one of them. Bear, maybe. Some could argue cow, wolf, mountain lion. You could argue all kinds of things that might be in that area. Yeah, it could have easily been. Could have easily been Bigfoot, too. I mean, we don't know. But whatever it was following him was a predatory type animal. That's all it follows. And it changed his perception for the rest of, rest of his life. Yeah, yeah, done. I do like how he says none of them would go outside talking about his friends to get to check on it to see if he was making it up. They're like, no, 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 no. You just sat right there. Yeah, tough, tough guy. guy. Right, yeah. right. They want to yeah. pick on you, but yeah. they're not brave enough to go out there themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of that. There's a lot of that goes on. Folks, let's take a quick break after this whole deal. We're going to bring Ryan on. And we're going to dig into some really cool UFO stuff we think you're going to love. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. Today's episode of Expanded Perspectives is brought to you by Raycon. Whether you're listening to EVPs that you previously recorded in that old abandoned psychiatric hospital, or listening to Woodknocks your buddies recorded last week near Mount Shasta, 
You want crystal clear audio quality. You want what you're listening to to be what you're listening to. Not what your roommates are listening to. Not what your significant other is listening to. Not what your children are listening to. You need to get yourself a great pair of wireless earbuds. But before you drop hundreds of dollars on a pair, you need to get up and check out wireless earbuds from Raycon. I'm telling you, I've owned several different brands of wireless earbuds, and my Raycons are my absolute favorite. Raycon earbuds start at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market, and they sound just as amazing as other top audio brands that you know and love. I love them. My wife loves them. She borrowed mine when I first got them in a few times and then demanded that I get her a pair. Their newest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds, are their best ones yet. With six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and more compact design that gives you a nice noise-isolating fit. That is so true, Philly. So very true. Raycon's wireless earbuds are also so, so very comfortable. They're perfect for podcast listeners, and they're great for phone calls, y'all. I love like legitly love them. And what I love about them is they stay put. I put them in. I don't have to worry about them going anywhere. When they're in my ears, they're comfortable and they won't wiggle. They don't. It's just good stuff for me, right? And unlike, of course, some of your other wireless options, Raycon earbuds look good. They're very stylish, y'all. And they're discreet. So you don't get the stems. You don't get the wires. You don't get any of that, especially in like a video call. We could run the show listening with Raycons. We could Bluetooth them in and rock and roll with them. Now, the company... Y'all are going to love this, was co-founded by Ray J and other celebrities like him. Get a load. Uh, Mike Tyson. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Snoop Dogg. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, of course, a lady I like listening to sing, Melissa Ethel. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. big fan. Now, look, I can't help it. I And you and I have talked about this. We have gone through a bunch of headphones. These are the ones that now have become my go-tos, hands down. And here's what y'all can do. Now's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. Get 15% off your order at buy, B-U-I, buyraycon.com slash expanded. That's buyraycon.com slash expanded for 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds. Buyraycon.com slash expanded. Well, hey, folks, on today's show, we got a really interesting guest for y'all. He's appeared on the show once before back in December of 2016, so almost four years ago. And since that time, a lot of things have changed in the UFO world, including the new second edition of his book, Somewhere in the Skies, A Human Approach to an Alien Phenomenon. He's a television host. He's a host of a great podcast. He's a public speaker and author, of course a personal friend of ours, and one hell of a snappy dresser. And a handsome devil. Joining us from the middle of the Pacific Ocean, it's the one, the only, Mr. Ryan Sprague. Hey, Ryan, how's it going? Wow, I don't know how to live up to that, man. You better. Um, Hey, (laughs) guys, thank you so much. I can't believe it's been four years. That's insane to me. We're talking off air how quick time goes and so much has changed since you and i last talked guys so it i'm goes, excited to dive into it it goes fast like that because it's life going down the drain remember how it spins real <laughs> fast for the water goes down yeah time's yep. flying by it, it's it's crazy <laughs> though it, it has gone by so fast and i remember when we had you on last time about the book somewhere in the skies the first edition uh what we really liked about it was like the personal experiences people had and how it changed their life and it seems like since that time Boy, there is a lot that's changed in the UFO world. I mean, from the the, the acknowledgement by the government of the, these Tic Tac videos, these gimbal videos, uh, the the Bob Lazar documentary, and of course him being on the Rogan show, uh, all this stuff about a tip, and the, I'm trying to think the Wilson Davis notes or documents. There's just a lot of been a lot that's been going on. And I wanted to get your take on that, as well as do you think there's a reason why it's coming out now? Or is it just coincidence? That is a really good question, man. A lot of people ask, like, you know, did you uh, coincide the coming out with your book with all of this stuff going on? And look, I had no idea. And any UFO researcher 
who says they knew in 2017 that the New York Times is going to drop that bombshell article about the Pentagon and UFOs. Uh, they're lying because nobody knew. And I think that's where things really changed, man. Um, like you mentioned, the acknowledgement by our own government, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon of a UFO phenomenon. Now, they're not saying any of them are saying it's alien or this or that, but they are acknowledging that it exists as a phenomenon and a potential threat. And that's more than they've given us in 70 years. So I do think a lot changed in that moment um, up till right now in 2020. Uh, a lot has been going on in the world. Uh, a lot of not good stuff. But for UFOs, man, uh, this is our year. And I can't believe I'm saying 2020 is the year of anything. But for <laughs> UFOs, uh it's huge. It's incredible. And I do implement that into the new version of the book. The entire conversation on UFOs has changed and it's exciting. Yeah, it's exciting. But at the same time, I think like you think about this topic your whole life. I know you, I know I have and Cam and as well as you. And now it's been announced and it just seems like it's not really in the news that much. I mean, it is in the news, but not a lot. You'd think it'd be a bigger deal that our government is acknowledging that we have off world or whatever they're calling it, uh, mm -hmm. ma materials, uh, what do they call them? Meta materials that they say that they've, they've recovered and are working on as well as, uh, the video footage from these F 18s and stuff like that, that that's off world technology. It's not somebody else. It, it, uh, it, you know, dignifies what Bob Lazar claimed all those years ago. Turns out that he probably was telling the truth the entire time. I mean, this is shocking. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is a crazy time. So the narrative before was that the government was looking into UFOs, what Project Blue Book and such, and then they closed it down. And then it come out, uh, I don't know if it was accidental or not, that they actually had a program working called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program or ATIP. And mm -hmm. I think now they've come forward to say that they didn't stop doing that either. Now they're doing something totally new. Uh, and so they've really been looking at this stuff behind the scenes this entire time. I think that's safe to say. And I know that a lot of other governments uh, probably are doing the same. Is there anything that you can tell me and Cam and the others uh, some more information about stuff like that? Because I'm sure you're way more well versed in it than I am. <laughs> it is a um, it's a crazy circus, man. So I'm still trying to dissect all of it myself. Now, you're right. We thought this all ended with Project Blue Book and um, that the the narrative within the government and our military was these UFOs pose no threat. Uh, we can find conventional explanations for most of them, if not all of them, and uh, move on with their lives. But now we're learning about the secret Pentagon UFO program, uh, supposedly ran for around eight years. But we know that it was probably many different iterations before that and after that. You know, once we learned about ATIP, uh, the former director of the program, Luis Elizondo, who left the program uh, because he was sick of the – uh, secrecy, the bureaucracy within the program, and no one was taking it seriously. He was bringing them extremely credible, legitimate UFO cases, and uh, no one wanted to hear it. So he quit, and he said, look, I'm going to do this myself then. Take the resources I have, the contacts I have, and look into this myself, and that's where he's at. Um, but we do know that ATIP continued after that, and now we're learning of a UFO task force being created uh, and a bill that will hopefully pass within the next uh, eight months, 10, 10 to 10 months about uh, a UFO task force within the Pentagon. So again, if you had told me three years ago that we would be having this conversation, I would have laughed at you. But uh, it's not a laughing matter anymore. I know. It's it's crazy. I mean, I have always been a believer, you know, like I've always been into that stuff. But now it really do, it, it's it's crazy because it really changes your ideas on everything. I'm thinking back to all the stories I've heard that I thought, well, maybe that was a little bit BS. And I'm like, well, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's 100 percent real. Maybe yeah. that's why we are starting the new, new branch of the military, like the Space Force. Is there something more that they haven't told us that they should be telling us? And also you hear stories about like these secret programs that even higher ups aren't allowed to investigate. I know uh, a Dr. Eric Davis interviewed, mm -hmm. uh, what was his name? Admiral Thomas. And he was uh, the head of intelligence for the joint chiefs back in the early nineties. And he said that he uncovered 
uh, some secret program and he tried to get access to it and he was always denied. Even though he held the rank that should give him access to that information, he was denied every time. So it almost is like there's a real government and then a shadow government that is really controlling stuff and they don't even let the higher ups know about it. Perhaps even the president himself isn't aware of it. So it makes you start you start mm-hmm. thinking about all these sci-fi movies you see or the X-File episodes where there's a secret base. And, you know, your mind can go on and on thinking about this crazy stuff. But I just I wonder why I wonder why now like they just is there something they don't know that they are they're trying to prepare us for or are they simply just incompetent and they just it got out and there's no way they can t- uh, try to rectify the situation so they're like yeah yeah you're you guys we, we don't know what those are yeah i i you know what i think it's both i'm really at this point in uh this whole conversation of ufo disclosure where i think there's a lot going on i think in one way their hands are being forced and by they i mean whatever government you believe in that holds any information on this, whether it's the government we know publicly or a black budget program or anything like that, like you mentioned, and with the phenomenon itself. I mean, I spoke to a a military UFO witness last week who was, uh, you know, part of this new endeavor with to the Stars Academy and Tom DeLong and all that stuff. And, uh, He straight up told me, look, this isn't by chance. This isn't all coming out right now for no reason. There is a reason. And uh, as we inch closer to whatever that reason might be, I think people will be surprised, uh, probably shocked, um, some happy, some scared. And uh, I don't know, man. Like, I can't pretend to know where any of this is heading, but um, it's interesting. And there has to be a reason that the Department of Defense and the Pentagon are doing this and getting certain information out to the public. It could very well be for national security purposes and that alone. Or it could be, look, these UFOs, they're a potential threat. We need to up our military budget. That could be Mm. the reason alone right there too. But I do think there is something more to it. I think whatever these UFOs represent, uh, in their many forms and iterations, uh, they are making themselves more known now, more than ever. And I think we are getting closer to those newer questions. Not if US, UFOs exist, but who's in control of them? What do they want? And why are they here? Right. Excellent. Um, I know since we haven't had you on in four years, th- there's a lot of our listeners that may not have heard you the first time. So let's kind of talk about your book. Let's kind of talk about your first sighting. And kind of what got you interested in this phenomenon? Yeah, absolutely. I did have a a initiation, I guess, as I would call it, <laughs> uh, into this topic. I did have a UFO sighting when I was 12 years old. Uh, I was fishing off a dock in the uh, St. Lawrence River, which is in upstate New York. Uh, it actually borders Canada and the United States. It separates the two where I was fishing. I could literally see Canada on the other side, which was always really cool. Um and it was turning turning dark, you know, so I'm reeling my line in for the night, and uh, I see in the water a reflection of three white lights in a sort of triangular formation. And I immediately, I look up, and at the time I was listening to Green Day on my Discman. I remember that specifically. <laughs> nice. So this really puts you back in the mid-90s, and uh, I remember looking up and seeing the lights above me uh huge massive formation no solid structure like i couldn't see a machine or anything like that but i couldn't see you know as a lot of people say like i couldn't see anything behind the formation of lights Mm -hmm. no stars nothing like that and it was completely silent whatever it was um i ripped my headphones off just to see if i could hear anything nothing I could hear like my music on the headphones from wherever I threw my discman and I could hear the water hitting the dock. That was it. So I was, I was pretty scared. You know, I was 12. I didn't know what the hell I was looking Mm -hmm. at. And I start yelling for my father to come out. Uh, we were staying at a motel that was right on the dock of the river and, um, I couldn't get anything out. Like I was, I can't tell you if it was fear or um if whatever was above me was somehow controlling me i mean that's getting really out there but that is something we do have to explore and uh, i couldn't 
do anything. I felt frozen. And then finally, I got a little squeal out. My dad comes out, and he actually watches this thing with me. So I had another witness to see this. And when he came out, that's when the thing started moving towards Canada. It disappeared over the uh, you know, the horizon, the crest of the water and the sky, and disappeared out of sight. And um, it was an uncomfortable night. I, I'll be honest, like I was terrified. I was scared. I kept arguing with my dad that it was not a plane. It was not this. It was not that. And I could tell, I could tell he was uneasy. Like he didn't have an explanation to tell me yeah. as my father. And, uh, that, that scared me. And I had nightmares for years after that. And it was just a snowball effect from there, guys. I became obsessed. I started <laughs> taking out books on UFOs. You know how that goes. Yeah. You just start going down the rabbit hole. And I, uh, I, I conducted my first interview with a UFO witness at age 13, and it was a Vietnam veteran who had a UFO sighting over the Pacific Ocean. So it was from there, it just opened wide for me, and uh, it's been crazy ever since. Oh, that's I, – I still love the idea that that was your first interview. A veteran like yeah. – it's still – that's one of my favorite things is, is – is they were willing to go, yeah, I think I, I'll share it with you. Because you were genuine. You were like, look, I've seen something, and I'm genuinely obsessed with something going on. And they mm -hmm. would open up. and Because it's just not you know normal. Yeah, they would kind of amuse a child. But at this point, they could tell that you're like, well, no, this it, is pretty serious. Like, I want to know what's going on. Absolutely. You, you hit the nail on the head, man. And again, like, this guy, he, he could have just brushed me off. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I – it was – you know, I, I got connected – to him through uh through a family friend and this dude was like up there and he was he had never told the story before so he wanted to get it out there and i sat and listened to him talk for over three hours and maybe 10 minutes of it was about the ufo the rest was about his military career and that was just as interesting and exciting but um i will say this i wrote it down i put it in a school report and then not two months later that guy passed away and oh, mm. I was the one and only person he ever told about the UFO event. So I hold that very close yeah. to me. I was honored that he shared it with you me. You saved it. And yeah, yeah, man. If he just got it out to one person, that was enough. He couldn't explain it then. He probably couldn't explain it before he left this, uh, you know, this mortal coil. And yeah. let's just hope he has the answers now. Yeah, for real. Well, I want to ask you. I, well, I, I want to ask you on behalf of the listeners so you can explain it, too, because you wrote a really good article this past June, uh, and Jim Harold's posted it, uh, The Navy, mm -hmm. A Rock Star, and UFOs by you, me and me go, and I want to I want to have you discuss your feelings on the whole Tom DeLong becoming involved with this UFO thing, because I know when he first started, he it wasn't necessarily very well received. Mm -hmm. And everybody kind of was like, closed their doors to him because they're like, here's just another Hollywood guy trying to make some money off of using his name and face, getting involved. And there's no seriousness to any of this. And right. that's the way it's going to be. But steadily, he's proven that it doesn't necessarily seem to turn out that way. Like there seems to be a genuine respect for the research and a genuine passion for what he's doing. And so... I want your take on it, again, because you're very close to it, closer than Kyle and I are. So that's what I wanted to get you to discuss with everybody is your whole Tom DeLong take on this whole deal. Yeah, I, I definitely have a sordid uh, history with Tom DeLong for <laughs> sure, man. Um, but no, let me – I'll give you my brutally honest opinion on all of this. And um, I think some of the, the UFO researchers – that I find most inspiring are those who are willing to adapt and change their mind. And that definitely happened for me. I mean, I was a huge Blink-182 fan. Mm -hmm. I loved Tom DeLonge. I loved his music. Um, and it was a big part of my upbringing. Um, but when I found out that he was interested in UFOs, it didn't go back to when he formed to the stars. This dude has been into this long, even before Blink-182 was at their peak. I mean, I remember going to a UFO conference maybe eight, nine, oh, God, ten years ago. Oh, man, time flies. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, and I remember sitting there. I'm volunteering at this event. Um, I'm listening to speakers talk all about everything about UFOs, and I look in the corner, and there's Tom DeLong, like just in the corner by himself listening, and I, 
I, I, it was almost like a Bigfoot sighting. I'm like, yeah. is this really happening right now? <laughs> um, so I go up to the conference organizers. I'm like, what the hell is Tom DeLong doing here? And they said, oh, he's crazy into this stuff. And he really genuinely wants to know what's going on. And I was like, right on. That's really cool. And then it was the years after that where um, I start to see that while he was on the road touring with the band and everything, they were stopping in Roswell. They were stopping in these, you know, Aurora, Texas. And he was really looking into these things. And that's when I started to gain a respect for him. Like he wasn't just interested in aliens. He wanted to know the history of ufology, the pinnacle cases. And, um, and that was it. So, you know, some years passed and then we come to find out that he left Blink-182 to start this company dedicated to researching UFOs. And like you said, I think when it first came about, everyone thought this was just some dude looking for something cool to do and maybe he'll make some money off of it. But I'll tell you this, after personally talking to Tom uh, on occasion and seeing what he's done in the past few years, he is as serious as can be about this. And he has gotten more out of this entire topic than any of us have done in 70 years. So love him or hate him. Um, if you believe the narrative being brought forth by he and his company or not, you cannot deny that they have made huge waves in the government when it comes to this topic. And we have been striving for that for years and years. So it's been a really interesting, uh, navigation. I support this company wholeheartedly, um, and as objectively as I can as a researcher and a, uh, you know, a quote unquote journalist covering it, um, and seeing where it goes. But Dude, they have blown this topic wide open. Tom DeLonge is a passionate mofo, and he just wants answers and the truth. And I think he's gotten closer than any of us has. And what that truth is, we may never know, but uh, we're getting there. And with him on board, I, uh, I'm i excited to see where it all goes. Well, I'm right there with you. Is when it first came out, I was, I'm not going to lie, I was annoyed when I first heard it. I was extremely annoyed, not even knowing any of his history, just knowing the music. And then looking at this is I was like, this, this is just one of those things that these yep. guys with money and fame decide they're going to do. You know, they want to go, oh, I'm going to go play adventurer or I'm going to. And there's people that are always dabbling, not staying in their lane, getting in other things. And then it never really works out. And I just assumed and you should never do that. But I did that. This was going to be one of those 15 minute thing. And then that would be it. We would move on and it would be a good laugh. And then the longer it went on, and then the more I listened to and the more I read, I'm like, this, for some reason, he has stroke somewhere enough to get, like you said, to start opening doors that didn't normally open. And I yeah. don't understand how he pulled that off, because you would think they would be even more closed to someone with his level of fame and his uh, size of following. But that's not what I happened. It was very strange. It was almost like that's what we needed. That's the shot in the arm that this thing needs, this whole study needs to turn over the next rock. Like the the final rock was the heaviest before we could go any further. And everybody left and couldn't, and he just happened to be the, the one extra guy you needed to help flip that rock over. Now we go keep moving till we get to the next roadblock. Absolutely. And I think there's another important aspect to this to keep in mind, too. I mean, the people giving Tom DeLong information, the intelligence people mm -hmm. he's working with or military, uh, you know, they're not doing this altruistically, you know, altruistically to just give him information. They want something out of this. And we have to question and wonder what that is. But Tom DeLong has been vocal from the very start when he started this company. If I am going to go in there and uh, try to get information on UFOs, I want to do something for the military. And he said straight up from the very beginning, I want to paint the military industrial complex in a good light. I want to show people that, um, you know, we can have trust in our government. We can, um, we can have trust that our military is doing the right thing and protecting us. Like, let me help paint you guys in a better light. And they said, yeah, let's do it. Like, that's the negotiation right there. And maybe he'll get some information on UFOs. And you know what? I think Tom DeLong's winning at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we seem to be getting a lot more than I think even he thought in a very condensed amount of time. I remember him saying this project was supposed to take 
decades to get to where we are right now. So um, we can only imagine what's going to come next. Yeah, for sure. Another part of uh, the article that you wrote, which one of my favorite parts is of you writing, telling the story of Favor and Kevin Day and everyone that was involved in that Tic Tac sighting is, do you think that the release or let's say the exposure of that video might have been one of or will probably be looked back upon, let's say in the next 30 to 50 years, as one of the largest keys to get these tires and gears rolling again, probably more than anything. Like, is that video to you? Because I feel this way. I haven't ever said it, but I feel this way. Is that video to me is kind of like the Patterson Gimlin video is for Bigfoot researchers. Is that video is the one that now... You can't deny the men that were involved in this. It's one thing to try to deny somebody at the trailer park. It's a whole nother thing to divide, try to deny men with 20 plus years of experience in the military at this saying, this is what it is. And here's the video. And all I'm telling you is exactly what I saw. Dude, I, I'm so happy you bring this up because there have been, um, you know, skeptics and debunkers being very vocal about these UFO videos lately. And I'm all for skepticism. Mm-hmm. I am a open minded skeptic myself. I am actually much more skeptical than I think a lot of people think <laughs> I am. But um, that being said, you know, making this argument that pilots are no more better observers than civilians, that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. To me. That makes absolutely no sense. These people are trained observers. That is 99% of their job to identify threats in our skies. So like you said, when Fravor said he could not outrun this thing, he had absolutely no idea how it was uh, propelling itself or moving. Um, That is a problem. That is a huge problem. And another big thing to keep in mind too is context. Now with that that uh, Tic Tac video. Yeah, I do think it is the uh, Patterson Gimlin of our day, for sure. We're going to be de- debating those videos um, forever. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, they came out, what, three, almost four years ago now, and we're still talking about yeah. them. So that's, it's got some longevity. But um, I think what's most important, too, is we saw a fraction of that video, and we have heard from every single individual involved with that specific event that the video is much longer, and there is more than one Tic Tac. Now, that's what I want to see. Maybe we'll get there someday. Yeah. Maybe we won't. But like you mentioned, we have Fravor. We have uh, Gary Voorhees. We have Kevin Day. These are guys that were on the ships that day and can tell us the full story. Yeah. The video, fine. 30 seconds, cool. Um, That means nothing if you don't have the context of what actually happened. And the fact that this many people on those ships that day, the Princeton and the Nimitz, are willing to tell their stories of what happened that day. Um, we are extremely fortunate for that. And I actually have a full new chapter in the book all about Kevin Day, the guy who first tracked this mm-hmm. Tic Tac event and how it changed his life, man. It, it completely changed his life. So and he yeah, we are not done. Yeah, he wasn't a scrub. That's a senior radio operator, a radar operator there on, on USS Princeton. Yep, That's what absolutely. that guy does. Yeah. And like it, is that's his job to keep yeah. everyone alive is to know what's in the sky. Well, so it, when he tells you there's some shit up there, I don't know what that is. It's serious. Yep. Right. And those videos, it's not just that uh, Lieutenant Fravor was a trained observer. His equipment, his targeting acquisition equipment, his avionics, his FLIR pod developed by Raytheon and all that. It can't keep up. It can't track that that tic tac thing that's flying through those images you see. So, I mean. State of the art equipment that that can't keep up with it. So I mean, it's not just an observation. Right. There There's comes video a video of the, and I'm sure you heard Doctor, uh, not Doctor Lieutenant Fravor on the Joe Rogan podcast, right? You heard that interview. Yes, I did. Yeah. Right. So the most interesting story I thought the entire time was Here when he go. was talking about the guy <laughs> in Puerto Rico that was picking up the telemetry rounds off mm-hmm. the submarine, and something came up from the abyss and mm-hmm. grabbed that torpedo telemetry torpedo do you remember man so now that the government's coming forward to this like i'm like are all the uso stories i've heard about real was the shag harbor incident up in nova scotia was that real it it probably Mm. was yeah man i think that's another aspect of this that people are forgetting uh the tic tac's one thing but there was something massive under the water there during that training exercise that too it was a training exercise I mean, these guys didn't have live rounds or anything. So whatever that UFO was, if it 
fired on them, they had absolutely no way to fire back. Yeah. And something was under the water. Something seemed to be directly correlated to the tic tac in the air under the water. What that is, we may never know, but um, I can share this with you guys. In the book, speaking to Kevin Day, um, this guy has formed a group with other members who were there that day, and they are working with some of the leading scientists pioneering all types of UFO exploration right now. And um, they're heading back out there to try to see if these things are still there, if they can detect anything. And maybe this wasn't a one-time event. Maybe we could capture and record these Tic Tacs again. Because, I mean, they were tracking these things for days and days. So, again, it was not just a one-off thing. These things have been there for days before they finally captured it on camera. So it's crazy, crazy. And then it was actively jamming radar, which is, I mean, that's something that you don't do. It's a declaration of war is what that is. And they're actively jamming the radar of arguably the most sophisticated radar country uh, on the planet. And they were like, no, we don't think so. And then we're still playing and felt such little threat from them. It would be like the threat you feel from ants or birds while you go about your day. That's the way they felt about it because they knew, like, you can't catch us. You can't do anything to us. Like, we must look extremely primitive in our forms of travel to what they – when they look at us. Absolutely, man. And I think threat is the key word you said there. Uh, It may not even be the UFO itself that's a threat to us. Our reaction and response to it could be all the threat there is. I now, think you that's look it. At like the, uh, you know, the Tehran incident. Look mm-hmm. at that one. This guy could have fired on this UFO. It jammed his weapons. Yeah, that is that is a threat to us. But how he reacted and responded and the fact that none of these pilots have protocol on how to deal with UFOs or even how to report them, uh, we could be the potential threat in all of this, like you said. They're so highly advanced and sophisticated, whatever the UFOs are or represent, that uh, us simply firing upon it could cause more trouble than that UFO ever could have. So, yeah. yeah. I always I, I laugh at the fact that we're worried about shooting it and it jams our weapons, but it's never once, or they, or whatever this is, hasn't taken a truly aggressive approach with us. It treats us like children. Like it takes away the scissors. You're running. You can't run with those. I'm going to take those away from you. You can continue to run, but you can't carry these anymore. And that's the way it kind of mother hens us is because we want it. What do we do? We got to shoot it. We don't know what it is. Let's shoot it down. It might be dangerous. And we go to shoot it down and it laughs. And like you realize it could kill us all. If it can stop you from firing, don't you have an idea that why do you think it knows how to stop you from firing? Because it's been fired at by something else. That's how it knows defense. So in turn, it has an offense, but it's never used it. And if it has, we've never, ever seen it like it's never been discussed. That to me is the thing that people are leaving out. And that's another part I wanted to ask you is like with this, looking back at these older cases of disinformation, and I went blank on the fella's name that they've used and and came forward after he was dead. Remember, they used him. I think he killed himself or something because mm-hmm. they used him for disinformation and all these things. And all the time that everything was printed and all the disinformation the government has put out to where this past April, they finally were like, no, no, it's real. You know, we know these things are real. So they've openly just then admitted to all their wrongdoing the last 70 years of the way they've treated these people. They've known yeah. this whole time. And my concern was. At the time they were doing their most active work to hide it, what was going on then? Was that when they really first started coming down here and we really started getting involved? Or has it been that involved for all these years? Because it doesn't feel like it. It really feels like they didn't look at us until the atomic bomb testing. Like they may have stopped by, but they weren't actively engaging with us like they must have been doing in the 50s and 60s. Absolutely. That's such a good point to make, man. I mean, um, chronology has a lot to do with this, I think. And you're right. I think I personally agree with you that the atomic bomb was the first beacon for whatever intelligence may be out there, whether it's in our own Mm -hmm. galaxy or beyond. That was definitely like, hey, whoa, that little blue guy over there is uh, potentially more dangerous than we thought. Um, Monkey's got bombs is what they were saying. Something's not right. right. But then I do wonder, too, you know, 
um, all the times that these UFOs have been sighted over nuclear sites mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, turning them off, deactivating our weapons. You're right. There's never been a truly aggressive case that I can think of of a UFO um, offensively attacking us. Um, again, it seems that any negative implication to a UFO sighting um, or physiological effect is happenstance um, or the intelligence behind this UFO. Uh, it doesn't it's not meaning to do that to harm us, mm-hmm. but it's just how we react to it and uh, the way our human condition is. Um, so, yeah, I do think there is a lot to that. Um, maybe. This whole disinformation campaign throughout the years, whoever was doing it, whoever was involved, uh, did it for reasons they thought just, and they were just doing their job. And that's that sucks in one way, yeah. but I also understand it. Like These people have a job, and sometimes it's to uh, protect us. And if we don't know what's truly going on, or they do need to uh, to do something like that, um, maybe that's the only way to do it. So I struggle. I struggle with yeah. the ethics behind something like disinformation, but at the same time, I am sure I've been pumped some disinformation in my time. Oh, uh, I'm I don't sure think we all a have. UFO researcher until you have been. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I and I do I I believe with what you're saying 100 percent is uh, I feel like it's more of a national security reason was what it was released for, not so much that they care if we know or not because I think that. If you ask most people, if you could legitly take an on the street poll, you'd be surprised the number of people would be like, yeah, I don't think we're alone. Like they may not go into detail of what they believe, but you'd be like, would you be shocked if you found out they were aliens? And I think you'd be surprised the number of people would be like, no, nah, I wouldn't be surprised yeah. at all. So I think it's more for national security. But to shift gears, I want to ask you with all your new release now, what are some of I would guess would be your favorite that you've personally researched that like had an effect or you could really tell like this one is like a hang your hat on case moment, which like, give me a couple of those. It might be your favorite for, for that. That might make you like before this was released, let's say before you got the, re- the, cause that's what we talked about on the show is all of us didn't really need the government to say it. It just feels good to be validated that you're not out of your mind that you're like, okay, I'm just, I'm not as crazy as I thought. Yeah, um, there's there's a few. I'll share um, two stories that really impacted me uh, from the first edition. There was one uh, by a gentleman named Scott Santa. He's a retired Coast Guard and um, uh, UPS worker, and he had a very dramatic UFO sighting. I might have even talked about it on my conversation with you guys before, but uh, in brief, he was at a drive-in movie theater. He was with a friend in their car. And this chevron-shaped, massive, sleek, black UFO, no windows, no appendages, nothing, uh, floated over the drive-in movie theater, shut off all the power, coasted over the theater. Hundreds of people got out of their cars, looked at this thing. They tried to start their cars, some of them to leave. Cars wouldn't start. So you've got this really close encounters-esque thing going on. Um thing coasts over, disappears into a field, all the power comes back on. And then, you know, you would think people would start talking about what just happened and everything. No. The movie starts. People get back in their cars. They watch the movie. Scott gets out, goes to the bathroom. Nobody's talking about it. They watch the whole movie and they go home. And that one astounded me. Like, what? what is that? Was it an instant amnesia? Uh Did whatever was above them control the feelings or emotions of those below? But nobody was talking about it. And some years later, Scott had a trigger memory where this whole thing came flooding back. And I looked. I looked for other witnesses. I looked for anything I could to validate this man's story. But all I had was him to rely on. And that's a lot of pressure for him as a witness and for me as a researcher to trust that. So many years later... um, after trying to track down anyone involved with this to no avail, I got an email and it, the headline said, you know, the subject line said drive in movie theater. And I was almost nervous to, <laughs> to open it. You know, I'm like, Oh no. Okay. Um, I click on it and boom, this woman, Cynthia, she just laid it all out. She said, I read your book. I heard the story about the drive in. 
I lived a town over. My boyfriend worked at the, that drive-in movie theater that summer, and we saw it a town over, that object. And I have no doubt he's telling the truth and what he saw happened. And the funny thing, too, was she also said that she didn't remember it happening until sometime later. So whatever the hell that thing was above the movie theater and out there in Ohio when where this happened, it had some memory effect on these people. But even more interesting is we finally had validation. This happened to this guy. And when I brought that email to him, like I could hear it in his voice. He was like almost ready to cry. He's like, finally, finally I have closure. Like I'm not crazy. I didn't make shit up. And Man. this happened. So that one was really powerful for me. Yep. And yeah, it that's, just jogged their memory. That's what's so wild is so everybody there got that flashy thing for men in black. Exactly. So they got that's hit what with. I envision happening. Yeah. And look. You go back to the work of Jacques Vallée, and he's been talking about control systems for years. Like maybe these UFOs have some sort of um, mechanism that, um, that can control us, hypnotize us even. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was a fascinating case uh, with Scott. And um, there's some new cases in the book that I bring forward that have never made been made public before either and i'd be happy to share one if you'd like yes or, um, whatever you guys want yes hit us with one yeah, give us one you don't want to give too much away yeah, but don't yeah just, one good exactly. one good one will, will suffice boom boom i've got one for you so this is the most recent case i could find um this happened in 2019 and um this guy came to me with it this was in michigan and um it's really interesting this dude his job is he uh he goes to beaches and he's collects rocks. He's a gemologist. That's what Kyle does and on the side. <laughs> boom. There you go, man. You might even know this guy. <laughs> no, I do not do that. Ah, well, hey, you're going to want shells. I'm sorry. It's shells <laughs> with Kyle. Go ahead. My bad. <laughs> um, so this dude, Eric, he's a gemologist. He, uh, he made this fascinating discovery in Michigan of these luminescent rocks and it had something to do with, you know, the chemical reaction of the rock to the water and where that water came down from. And they think it came from Canada. And it actually makes these rocks glow at night, which is super cool. So, I mean, people started flocking to this town, you know, gemologists and rock collectors um, to try to find these things themselves. So, you know. Being an entrepreneur, Eric was like, I'm going to take people on tours, charge them for it, mm -hmm. go out there, find these things. And um, all the power to him because he's created this very successful business. And then it led to this event. So he uh, he brought three people out on a tour one night. And they're at uh, Whitefish Point off of uh, Lake Superior, Michigan. And they're looking for rocks and everything. And then one of the people on the tour is like, what's that out there? And they look over the water. And you've got one of those classic orange orbs floating over the water. Whatever. Could be anything. Chinese lantern. Could be a plane in the distance. Whatever. Um, then another appears. And another. And another. And I think in total there's around five lights that appeared. And they're all looking at it kind of like, ah, oh, interesting. That's that's really interesting. And um, all meanwhile, there's a ship out on the water. And it seems to be directly above the ship. So they thought maybe it had something to do with that. And the more they started to look at it and question it, the more the orbs started to act intelligent. They'd blink in and out in succession and then reappear. But the big clincher for me was one of the orbs, it breaks formation, flies within seconds over the beach where they were, hovers above them, shoots back out to the water, and goes back into the formation. I don't know what could do that that instantaneously and under that much intelligent control. But um, the way they described it, one of the women like hid behind a boulder. She was terrified. But this dude, Eric, he's like, I got to I got to know what this is. And he gets in his car and he starts flashing the lights at this thing. And it's responding. It's sending one orb up to the beach, hovering above them, disappearing, sending another hovering, disappearing. So. It was crazy. And these these uh, people on the tour, they were so scared that they asked him to get them out of there. He drives them back to town. He comes back and the orbs are still there. And he starts playing this game again with them, communicating somewhat with them. And it lasted for over an hour until they finally blinked out and disappeared. Um, so my first reaction was, you're there a lot. 
do you know what ship was out there? Let's get in touch with them. So he did. He was able to get in touch with the ship that was out over the water that night and ask them, like, were you guys doing something? What was going on? And all they said to him was, we have no comment. And, you know, that's fine. But he asked again. He's like, well, I just want to know, like, did were, were you involved with whatever happened that night? Because I have video of it. He did get video of this. And they said no comment. And they hung up on him. So I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. Whatever was out there was intelligently controlled. Um, it was powerful and secret secret enough that this ship did not want to comment on it or any of their people. And uh, I'm still working on the case. I'm, I'm hoping to get out to Michigan when you know things settle down yeah. and we can all go back to whatever new normal there is and uh, see what's going on out there because so this one knew. really astounded me. I think so. They knew, it, yeah. Because if they, if the best way would have been like, we don't know what you're talking about. We didn't see anything. Yeah, but the no comment business was like, hmm. And I guess because I know if they say, if as long as they say no comment, he can't show a video of them being there going, how did y'all not see this? But still, right. I mean, deny, deny, deny. But no comments like, oh, so y'all are completely aware of what's going on out here right now with these orbs. It says so much more, man. Yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah, man, that I love a, it. That's a great story. Um, yeah. The book is Somewhere in the Skies, A Human Approach to an Alien Phenomenon. Ryan, tell the listeners where they can find your book as well as your podcast. Absolutely. I do the show uh, every Monday. You can find it on all podcast apps, wherever you get uh, expanded perspectives as well. Um, other than that, the book's available in paperback and ebook, Amazon, you know, uh, Barnes and Noble. And then everything I do can all be found at my hub, and that's uh, somewhereintheskies.com. That's awesome. Now, I know a lot of your speaking events have probably been canceled thanks to COVID, but what do you got coming up? That is a good question, man. Everything's going virtual these days, and uh, that's the same with UFO conferences. So uh, I do have a a section on my website where I will update people on any speaking engagements I'm doing virtually. Uh, but other than that, they could check out everything I'm doing on YouTube, Ryan Sprague channel, or at somewhereintheskies.com. That sounds awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on with us today, Ryan. We really enjoyed speaking to you again. We enjoyed your book, and we'll definitely have to have you on again. We won't wait four years this time. Yeah, yeah. let's let's do this more frequently, because <laughs> yeah. I think things are only ramping, ramping up with UFOs, For guys. Sure. But uh, no, huge honor. I always love talking to you, and keep up the great work. Thanks, Ron. Take care, man. with expanded perspectives whoop, 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 whoop. oh talking to ryan uh is so much fun i'm glad he came on uh, I'm, I'm jealous i wish i was with him he's in hawaii you, you know what my favorite never things been there. about talking to ryan every time we talk to him, my favorite thing about conversing with him whether it's in messages we send each other messages all that stuff is his upbeat happy personality i agree ryan it doesn't, I mean, he is one of those optimistic dudes. He's upbeat, and it's a joy to talk to people like that. And it's a joy to talk to him, man. It really is like, I. y'all all know what I'm talking about. Y'all all have those people that, yeah, you really respect them, you really enjoy, but they could be moody. I mean, hell, I get moody, Kyle. We all get, but Ryan, and I'm sure he does too, man, but every time, like, you can have some people you talk to that you just know are dull, and you're going to have to work to have a conversation with him. Ryan Sprague's not that man, dude. He is so much. He's like him. It's like him and Micah Hanks. Like those are the guys that you can always call them up and, and they're like they're, upbeat, like what's happening, man. And they're always excited. And I really, 
really appreciate that. Down to talk and very knowledgeable. I mean, that's yeah. what I enjoy. That's uh, the difference between us. We're, right. we're down to talk, but we're dumb. Exactly. And that's that's why we have them on. <laughs> yeah, you need to go get his book, Somewhere in the Skies. It's awesome. Uh, also, you need to check out his podcast. If you like UFOs, you like the UFO phenomenon, definitely his podcast uh, is there for you to listen to. I mean, he has a lot of cool guests on and things like that. He just does a phenomenal job uh, where we kind of we talk about UFOs sometimes, but not all the time. But uh, he digs and you, you'll find out, of course, if you've read his book. Remember the last interview. He's a legit researcher. Like, oh, yeah. Big, deep, deep into research like that guy knows what's up. And we also hang out with one other guy that, that worked with his publishing group, the D-man, Dolan. Dolan, same way. Those two guys oh, yeah. dig into it. That's why we rely on him. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That yeah, thing. yeah. I mean, Ryan, he he speaks at all the conferences. He does. He's been on TV. He's Movies, our UFO documentaries. Guy. I mean, yeah, he's our go. Tim and the D man are the yeah. go to UFO guys. We have to. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because I, I, there's it's too much. I had somebody the other day was just talking to me that listens that I work with. Now I forgot who it was, and it brought up. So it was Chris, and Chris had said he was listening to something and brought up, and I'm trying to remember what story he's talking about because I'm like, man, you would think you wouldn't forget him, but there's so much rattling around in here that I'm trying to sort out. Man, and I then get, I can't, I get confused because my biggest fear, and I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure y'all listening have caught Kyle and I in it before is you start telling one after you've already covered it two or three years ago, and then you tell it and combined another story. And then you get the message like, that's not how it went. You're like, Oh hell, you're right. Those are two different stories. Like not so then I gotta go back and re re research. <laughs> yeah, or people will ask me, like, you remember that story you did about blah blah blah? Or remember when that person I'm like, listen, man, I've had a lot of head trauma. I don't remember anything past like two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. So sorry, because they want to know more information. Like, do you remember or they'll go, Hey, what was the song you played on this? I mean, I'm like, there's no way I know that. Uh, yeah, I can't. If you do want to know, if you go to the show notes, like it'll tell you the songs used. Yeah. Oh, yeah. On that whole thing. Yeah. If want, and the, and the RSS feed uh, appears to be working again. Uh, there's been people messaging us that they're not getting every episode, that they're missing some. Look, I don't know what's going on. We uh, we have an IT guy. He thinks he's got it all straightened out as of right now, but uh, who knows? Yeah. This is. <laughs> Look, Colin, I don't. We've we've told y'all that. Y'all have watched the live streams. We don't know what we're doing. We're trying. All right? You'd think all these guys, like, they got it figured out for all these years. No. I still don't have it figured I out. I think part of the problem is, is when we started, there was, wasn't that many sources. So now there's like a million sources yeah. for, for it's way easier. listening to podcasts. But that also gums up the network or whatever. But I think we need to have another live stream in the next, next week or two. Well, boy, I'll tell you, Luke has been asking. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> He's like, man, I think you need to do a live stream. <laughs> And again, thanks for all the get well uh, messages for my son, Caleb, the one that got hit by the stingray. He is doing good. They're starting school on Thursday. And so they're looking forward to that. Me and I'm looking forward to him going to school, too, so I can get some work and get some peace and quiet at the house. <laughs> it has been a long, long summer, and, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking forward to some movies are going to be start coming out again. Like, I'm really looking forward to the new Ethan Hawke movie, Tesla. Yes. Because I'm a big fan of Nikola Tesla. And Antlers. Well, I got bad news for you. I saw where Antlers isn't scheduled to release till February of next year. Well, dang. I don't know why. But it still looks good, right? It does look good. It looks very good. And Luke is all fired up because they're in October they're uh, doing a new version of Candyman with the same guy. <sighs> the same guy as the Candyman. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> is his mother taking him to see that one? Oh, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> You're like, I'm not going to that. Uh, but I'm sure, Yeah. I have a feeling the next, you know, the next monster movie comes out. We're all going to have to go because he's going to be fired up. Right. And well, Shark Week is concluding. So I know that's your favorite week. I didn't even know what was going on, man. I'm all bummed out. Shucks. I missed it. Well, now Nat Geo does one that's like, it's not Shark Week. It's Shark Fest. And they do it a week earlier. So it's like the seven minute abs. Now someone who's doing six minute abs. Scumbags, man. <laughs> They're like, oh, scumbags. Oh, you get all the attention for Shark Week. Well, we're going to do Shark Fest and we're going to drop it a week early. I like Lobster Fest. Right? <laughs> Who don't? Shrimp Fest. Is that Shrimp Fest? No. What is that one? I think yeah, it is maybe Lobster it is. Fest. But it I is Lobster Fest. I don't like Shark Fest. <laughs> I'm not down with that. But Nat Geo, those are that's a dirty move. That's some dirty pool right there, isn't it? Right. The Stanley Cup playoffs are back. 
We're watching some hockey. Kyle called me the other day, folks, weeping because oh, the Pittsburgh we Penguins didn't make <laughs> it. Go. He was all upset Sidney Crosby wasn't going to be. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, for those he that ranted, did. folks, no lie. Five minutes before we even turned this thing on, he was looking at scores, and he was like, oh, yeah, I'm still so happy that they're not in the playoffs. I was complaining <laughs> about my team, that the, the captain's not doing anything except cashing checks. <laughs> <laughs> you need to be giving checks, not right. cashing them. Anyways, Come folks, back. if you have some cool stories you'd like to share or would you like us to forward on to Ryan, email the show at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can follow the show on all forms of social media. I really like those pictures that Cam's been posting lately of the classic looking artwork that also has Sasquatch or Dogman in it. How awesome. I you can those. get them on Pinterest. And I'm trying to get a hold of the artists right now. I yeah. am in messages with them now. Because what I would like to do would be able to link it either to the site or somewhere to get them traction because I want, I've got two or three more that I've saved up that I haven't even reposted from that other posting. Those are amazing paintings, right? I, I would, I'd like I to have those some. framed, right? Yes, and put we them need on like, them. On some metal frames or whatever, yeah. and you could have them hung. Those are pretty cool. Anyways, folks, be careful out there. Stay separate, more than six feet. Uh, yeah, we can't tell y'all to give somebody a hug anymore. You have to give them like Air 5 from across the room. Virtual hug. Virtual hug them. Yeah. Virtual hug them. Shoot text messages. That's another thing. Give them a text message hug. Well, And I, can't we all just, like, let's just be friends again. We let, every, everybody thinks gotten out of control. Let's all just be friends again. Everybody's got cabin fever. Yeah, Stir that's crazy. the problem. Quarantine We're fever. Cra- We're quarantine crazy. Right. That's right. it. Till next time, folks, I'm Kyle. He's Kim. Peace, y'all.